beat him to death. They beat him to death. They killed him. Why should they kill? Why? 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 Hello and welcome to this BFI home event. Today we're looking at the film Injustice and I have with me the uh, video blogger and author, critic from The Guardian, Peter Bradshaw, and its director and producer, uh, Ken Ferro, to talk about the film and to take a few questions. Um, we're going to be looking back at the 20 years since the film was produced and setting it um, very much in the context of the discussions around race and policing and uh, the depictions in film. Um, and uh, I'm going to be firing off a few questions, uh, first of all to Ken, and then bringing Peter in. Um, I think, um, Ken, um, I first screened this film with you, uh, I think about um, 19 years ago. We had, by some strange fluke, managed to get the screening uh, originally into Camden Odeon um, uh, due to the support of the local manager, only to find that within a couple of weeks, uh, the film had been pulled uh, and hence are having to transfer it um, to SOAS. Um, and in many ways that uh, kind of exemplifies the problems of just getting this film <laughs> into um, mm. spaces where people could see it. Yeah. Um, and that doesn't seem to have changed <laughs> over the last uh, 19, 20 years. Um, what are your observations um, on, on where we're at now and what's happened over that time to the film? Um, I think where we're at now is, you know, we're now talking on social media. Um, it's a very different time uh, in terms of the technical capability. So it is possible now for us to show films um, quite easily on the internet. Um, the thing about a film like uh, Injustice and the other work that we do is it's not just about the viewing, it's about uh, audience participation, it's about helping to mobilise people. And so having screenings, you know, in cinemas and in venues where people can actually not just show the film, but discuss the issues afterwards and engage in some kind of dialogue which then goes forward is, is what we're about really in terms of our approach to filmmaking. So I guess where we are today is that uh, we have a new platform, you know, which is uh, the internet where we can show things and have these discussions. And so we have to be able to operate on, on these two levels. I mean, currently it's very difficult to have physical screenings. Um, and I think there's a loss there in terms of the tactile meeting of people and, uh, and uh, not everybody's confident about speaking, you know, uh, and so it, you kind of lose that. But um, I, I suspect that the, help, the issues around injustice, well, I know the issues around injustice are gonna go on for, for decades. And uh, I suspect that it'll be shown again and again um, over the next 10 or 20 years, I suppose. More recently, obviously, the uh, George Floyd um, killing and uh, within uh, the last few days, um, Jacob Blake being mm. shot several times in the back mm. has, um, really uh, brought these issues to the fore in a way that um, perhaps many younger people are just engaging with them for the first time. Do you find it um, a tad maybe frustrating that, that um, there seems to be more of an interest in these issues uh, as they emanate st from stateside um, mm. than in terms of our home turf? I mean, you and I, you know, I think we both grew up in the same part of South London. We did, uh, yeah. the, We went to the same school together. We did. Um, if I was to characterise that world, it was tough, uh, probably episodically violent, yeah. but not um, intolerable. Actually, it was yeah. a good environment to grow up in. And it seemed to throw up people who were serious about wanting to make changes mm. and people who are serious about social justice like yourself. 
Yeah. Um, there are other names, Lenny James, I remember distinctly, Stephen K. Amos, um, and a whole host of very talented individuals who were prepared to break the mold, as it were. Yeah. So why is it, I suppose what I'm getting to, there's not such an interest, uh, I think, from of the general media, not just filmmakers, in a really rich vein of stories. Okay. There are a lot of questions there, currently. So, um, and I'll try <laughs> to break it down as succinctly as I can. It's interesting you mentioned we went to the same school because I, I don't think a lot of people realise that one of the other people I went to school with was actually Brian Douglas, who is one of the main characters, <clears throat> characters, yeah. one of the cases in the film. And the fact that I went to school with him and then we separated because obviously you move on and uh, you know, many, many years later I discovered that he was one of the people that had been killed by the police uh, made it for me, a much more personal film. And I think it's important that people realize that the background you're talking about is also one of um, a kind of collaboration between different groups of people. Migrant Media works as a collective of people from migrant, black and Asian backgrounds, and we work collectively. And so it's not really about the individual, it's about how we work and how we work with the communities as well. And I think that kind of working, um, is really important and was important in, in British filmmaking, particularly in the 80s and the 90s, I would say. Uh, and I think uh, we, we've lost that, but I feel that's coming back. I think that's part of the movement of people who are currently, um, the young people who are certainly uh, becoming much more active now uh, within the UK. Uh, we, this happened in 2016. I think people will remember that, you know, there were the, the US cases and then we had this kind of outburst. Uh, but of course, um, Black Lives Matter has been around for hundreds of years. Uh, black people and progressive white people have been saying that, that Black Lives Matter for, for centuries. So it's not a new thing. Um, and although it's uh, the frustration I do have is that there seems to be a fixation on the United States and a lack of um, awareness in terms of what's happening in the UK. I think um, what's happened recently in terms of the push towards a recognition of British imperial history and slavery and for the calls for the curriculum to be looked at. I think these are all very positive things and recognising Britain's past has to be done within schools, the education system, the recognition of COVID, all these things which accumulate. What I'm uneasy about is that there doesn't seem to be the same kind of focus on the deaths in custody in the UK. The names of the people in the UK are not really being spoken about in the same ways the government, the prime minister can talk about George Floyd, but he won't talk about Joy, Joy Gardner. And what I think everybody needs to remember is that the whole reason Black Lives Matter is happening is about the brutal killings of people at the hands of the police in the US and in the UK. And I think Injustice and the follow-up to the film, which will be released eminently, is trying to get people to refocus on what's happening here. Uh, people are using a slogan saying the UK is not innocent. Well, I think that's not enough. I think we have, we have the very clear evidence that the UK is guilty and it's about what to do about that guilt. And one final thing really is in terms of the families in, in, the, in the film who I'm still in touch with, they're still waiting for justice. They're not prepared to draw a line and say, okay, you can improve the police force and you can make these social and political changes and we'll be happy with that. That's not the case at all. So I think we have to, we have to deal with that very, very um, thorny issue. So I'm going to switch over to Peter now. And, and really throw that question back at you as a, as a film critic. Why do you think there is this um, almost glamorous notion of America and its social history, in particular around race, and yet a, a, a vast ignorance uh, in know. terms of the UK? I, 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 that is a very, very good question. It, it's the central question of our time, in a way. And it sure isn't for the want of Ken trying. Because when I sat down to watch this film 20 years ago, I was electrified. I thought, my God, this is a film which is doing the work that journalists should be doing, but for some reason aren't. And I, I remember vividly, you know, all the other documentaries that I would go and see uh, and still have seen in my obedient way for the last 20 years, they have been a product of what Noam Chomsky might call manufactured consent. That they, they're about subjects that we all kind of agree on, even if they're about very... Um, urgent matters of social injustice. There's an element of this has happened in the past. It was a bad thing, but it's in the past and it's all sort of settled now and we all agree and it's a bad thing. Whereas injustice 
was so blazing because, and it's part of the reason why it didn't fit in with the establishment, is because it, was, it grabbed you by your lapels and said, look, this is happening right now. This isn't finished, this isn't sorted, nobody's agreed. There are no government inquiries. There are no top ranking QCs sitting on blandly com complacent committees about this. Nothing's happening at all. And yet it is a crying scandal which is going on under our very noses. It is about injustice one, as I shall call it. Injustice one is about murders in police custody which happened before the smartphone camera revolution, before the digital media re revolution, before the social media revolution. In America, we've seen how these things have been challenged and contested because members of the public have been able to capture it on their phones. Uh, although uh, it happened before that, Rodney King famously mm. happened because somebody had an old fashioned big kind of smart, uh, big kind of digicam camera and he yeah. happened to be yeah. on his happened to be on his balcony, happened to see it. And we both thought, my God, this is incredible. How is this happening? How can it be? The, how can it be the case that an ordinary member of the public gets to film what they shouldn't be filming? Now this has become normal and commonplace and it has been an absolutely indispensable way of challenging, challenging power. But of course, what Ken's film is about is, is these things happening within police stations where there are no cameras, there are no smartphones. These things still happen in secret and it is only Film that I, I, I was going to say only films like Injustice the movie, but even that isn't true. There are, in a way, there are no films like Injustice the movie. I mean, we've, I've banged on about this. This is, this has to be the most important documentary of my professional lifetime, and yet it still can't be shown, or it can yeah. be shown. Now mm. we can put it up on Vimeo. We can talk about it online. That's true, and uh, you yourselves have made the important point that by showing the film in cinemas, you can create a discussion with real people. But in a way, it's, there's something else as well, is, is putting these films on in the cinemas creates a public affirmation that they exist. Uh, yeah. Because sometimes yeah. you, you put it up on Vimeo with all the other funny cat videos on and you know, it's as if it doesn't exist at all. I mean, people can see it, of course, that's great. And mm -hmm. it has created a new distribution model that was undreamt of when I first saw this film in 2001. But it's still important if it's going to create change, if it's going to exert pressure, it has to be affirmed that it exists in the first place. And that's still in the most enraging and frustrating way, a problem with this, this film, which is so much more important than all the other films that I watched. Do you think, Peter, there should be more respect for our own filmmakers shown? Sure. Not only in terms of you know, the, 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 the public, but also the industry itself. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I I sure, I, th I absolutely think that. And I think we, you know, um, in, the, in the media can, should be doing more about that and being more discriminating in a way against, uh, with things that are important as opposed to things which are less important. I mean, I, you know, I, I give space to interesting and amusing and diverting films all the time. And yet there's this film which is going on and it is about <clears throat> a genuine scandal, a crying scandal, which it happens all the time. You hear people from the right saying, look, this terrible thing has happened to George Floyd in America, but look, you know, let's not panic in this country. And you want to say, look, it's not about, I mean, it's partly about George Floyd. It's a global problem. Of course it is. But there has been this real outcry or kind of silent outcry in a way from, mm -hmm. from filmmakers like Ken, that this is happening right now. This is happening in police stations, in secret. Thank you for that, Peter. Um... I'm going to go back to Ken now. Um, now you're still pushing to get this film screened. Uh, and sure. I know that you've, you've actually moved on in some ways because you're talking about Injustice 2 now. Yeah. But um, sticking with the film that people have seen, Channel 4 um, was set up to provide space for a more challenging and interesting content. Um, and yet this film still hasn't been screened. Yesterday, I got a message that um, next year, uh, on the anniversary of George Floyd's death, uh, Channel 4 are proposing a Black Takeover Day. And not interesting to mark um, any of the experience of what's happened in Britain, but again, to mark the anniversary of George Floyd. How do you feel about that, given I've seen online there's actually a petition still running mm, yeah. to get your film screened by Channel 4? I feel... 
as angry today as I did when we finished the film. Uh, I was asked the same question, how do you feel uh, uh, about you know, spending seven years uh, making a film which Channel 4 refused to support, although they had supported the other films we'd made, including the film about Joy Gardner, who died in uh, police custody. Uh, in 1993. So I, I feel the same way. I mean, for the past 19 years, we've approached Channel 4 three times with the opportunity to show the film. And they've uh, three times told us they won't show the film. The reasons they gave uh, are shocking in my view. And I think just as a quick background, what happened um, when you were talking about the fact that the uh, Police Federation threatened cinemas with libel action, uh, initially when the film went out, which um, went on and on, uh, and it was a kind of very strange situation running up and down the country, having secret screenings. Uh, and every time a, a film with the film was banned effectively by a cinema, it was still shown the same day or the same evening in a pub or a club or, or somewhere where people were in the audience and said, we're going to show it. And I think the police got the message then that they couldn't kill the film, which is what they were trying to do. Uh, and what happened then is that uh, we actually show the film to the 13 police officers who are in, just, in the film, in Justice, and who are named and who are shown. And we told them that if they didn't stop harassing us uh, and threatening us in the cinemas, we would take them to court. And they stopped. Now, we have 13 individuals who are named and shown and accused of being involved either in murder or manslaughter, who then take a decision not to take us to court. People have to ask that fundamental question about why is that? Why did they not want to go to court? They didn't want to go to court for our trial, which would have been about basically loss of earnings because they stopped us showing the film, mm. because they'd avoided being in court for the actual crimes they'd committed. And so that's a background people have to understand. Despite the fact we took on the police federation and won, and we defeated the police essentially, uh, and we won uh, the legal argument, and I would say we won the moral argument. Channel 4 refused at that time to show the film, which I called cowardice at the time, and I continue to call that cowardice. And even now, 19 years later, in the context of today, in the context of the mass movement of people, and the, you know, every single organization in the country is saying, we have to do something about this, Channel 4 still refused to show the film. Now they may claim they're doing other, uh, making other films and, and, and so be it. But the fact is, is that Injustice deserves to be shown on Channel 4. And I give, go back to uh, Peter's point as well, is that it's not just about being on the outside and, and working in cinemas and as an underground filmmaker, which we actually don't want to be. We, we are the mainstream. We are the voice of the people. And Channel 4 are obliged, are obliged to hear the voice of the people and, and to show the film. That's what I would say. Um, are we not maybe being a bit unfair on Channel 4? I mean, ITV are running a very effective Black Voices campaign at the moment. Yeah, yeah. They've not screened it. No. Um, BBC, what's happening there? Um, well, I think um, that's true. Well, we had, we did talk to the BBC and they, they said they would screen it, but I would have to be the person that cut the film. And I think they wanted to cut it down to around 20 minutes. That's all that would be left from 98 minutes. And of course, I refused to do that out of principle. And I told absolutely. the BBC I would give them the film and they could show the entire film. I would give it to them. And they said, no, you have to cut it. And I think the whole point there is that what they're saying is that if you work as a journalist, filmmaker, documentary filmmaker, there are certain rules. The first rule is that you don't mess around with the authorities. You can accuse, you can investigate, but there are certain you know, uh, limits. And one of the limits is the police because the police are seen as a fundamental part of the state in terms of control of society. And I think they don't want to have a debate about what the police are about. Although it's still happening, people are talking now about defunding the police. So I'd be happy for BBC or ITV, but why Channel 4 in particular? Well, because Channel 4, uh, we had a very good relationship with Channel 4. Channel 4 has a very strong history of making oppositional, uh, experimental documentaries, uh, and they funded the workshop movement. They funded people like uh, um, uh, John Acomfra, Smoking Dogs, you know, Black Audio mm -hmm. Film Killer, Jeff Shadow. So they have a history, and they have a history with us as well. And Channel 4, unlike all the other broadcasters, are always talking about how radical they are, how much they're you know, uh, dealing with issues which other broadcasters won't do and can't do. 
Uh, and uh, I remember when we, we, we broadcast the film on Channel 4 in the sense that we screened it on the side of the building uh, as a protest. So it was, it's been shown on Channel 4, but not in the usual way. Uh, the, 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 the new uh, deputy, the, the new head of Channel 4 had taken on that week and made a statement about how Channel 4 was going to be the bravest and the boldest broadcaster ever. Well, where is their bravery today? Where is their boldness today? Do you think, Kent, if I could jump in, do you think they might be likely or it might be a possibility that they would show your, your new film? I mean, if they're saying, well, this is kind of, this film is too old for us to show, I mean, would they? I, do I don't think it's the age, yeah, just... yeah. I don't think it's the age of the film. I think no. the problem with them is that they, they really uh, don't want to take on the Police Federation. And I think we have to all be aware that um, the situation is getting worse. Now, I'm not, a, I'm not a conspiracy theorist and I don't like to escalate the situation when it's not that bad. And, and when we made Injustice, we counted a thousand cases between 1969 and 99, so that's 30 years, uh, uh, over 30 years. And since then, there's been over a thousand since 1999. So the, the number of the people that are dying in police custody in this country are escalating. That is an absolute fact. And that's borne out by the figures that are provided by the Home Office. That's the first thing to say. The second thing to say is that this is going to go on and on unless people do something about it. Um, so I, I think... Uh, it, it's not just, and these cases, as I said before, you know, I know Joy Gardner's son. He's now a man with a child. He's walking around with this in his heart and in his head. I know the children of Shiji Lupito. They're still in touch with me. They're, these people are still out there and they're part of a family and part of a community. And they deserve an answer. They deserve an answer from Channel 4, which is why the families themselves have been online asking Channel 4 to show the film. I mean, I'm going to hold it there. I mean, Peter, Injustice very clearly is a film that uh, puts its heart on its sleeve. Um, there's a, a very strong polemical strain to it. In terms of uh, documentary filmmaking and just filmmaking in general, I suppose, is there something about the aesthetics of dealing with politics and film that um, until really the Black Lives Matters uh, uh, worldwide kind of campaign has been out of kilter with the way the film industry sees itself? Yeah, I think part, partly that's true. It doesn't, the thing about Injustice is that it's not nice and smooth and sleek uh, and humorously aestheticized in a way that Michael Moore or any of these other people are. All these other political movies, you might call them political movies, have devised their own kind of emollient aesthetic, which says, look, here it is, you get it right. This isn't, this is a political movie. And for example, we're gonna be complaining about, let's say Walmart uh, and it's uh, the way that it's distorted po uh, economics in America and crushed small mom and pop businesses. But it's also a movie that asks you to like it, asks you to laugh along with its various humorous uh, excursions and at the end there is going to be like a website or somewhere where you can get joined and get involved and all those things are fine but they are part of a kind of diplomatic aesthetic in filmmaking which doesn't rub you up the wrong way that makes you think okay here it is it, this is a nice little product and you can get involved or you could not get involved if you choose to kind of not get involved that's fine too Whereas Injustice movie is much more raw and powerful. It says that, you know, it's not, it's almost goes beyond the idea of filmmaking of what is and is not a nice, cool and accomplished and technically stylish way of making a film. It's saying none of those things are important compared with the screaming injustice of what we're talking about. So it's just too, it's just too raw and powerful to some, for some people to deal with. It's, it's, it's like the live rail that you're not supposed to touch. And yet, and yet, Peter, the, um, I mean, at the beginning, Ken was talking about the impact of people using their mobile phones yeah. to make films. Yeah. Um, and to film, I mean, the filming of George Floyd's death, uh, which I'm going to be honest, uh, I've, although I've been an anti-racist for 30 years, I didn't want to watch. No. I've seen it too many times. It's horrifying. But, but the capture of that most graphically has moved people. It has. Um, and in a sense, it um, complements the approach that Ken has taken in his filmmaking and validates it in, in many ways. It does, it does. The difficulty is, is because we can't show, people respond, of course, viscerally to the 
the violence and the injustice that they see in the George Floyd case because it's been captured, interestingly, by young people. I mean, I think I'm right in saying that the George Floyd video was captured by somebody who was 17 years old. Yeah. Um, whereas, again, we're, we're back to this whole thing. The deaths in custody happen in secret. They, you, can't, you can't film them. I mean, maybe there should be more CCTV cameras. There is, there uh, yeah, is, yeah. Peter, yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, the, the, like, the, body, the, like body cameras on, yeah. on police. Yeah, I mean, one thing to say, because I know this point came up before, is that, you know, I, I have seen video of uh, people in this country being killed by the police using the same words, I can't breathe. Right. And yet that hasn't been no. widely broadcast. So I think, through, you know, that it, it hasn't broken through. And one of the points no. that has to be made is that, of course, the news does record and, and it, it, it does record these incidents that's happened. But mm. I think it's not just about the, it's, it, it's important that it gets recorded. And of course, then you have this international outcry, but it's what to do with those images. As a filmmaker, yeah. it's about where does this go? And it's about families who, uh, the families are the ones that actually have the answers. And they would say that if you're gonna look at these images, look at these images. If you're gonna look at the films, look at the films. Mm. But we want these officers in jail. Yeah. That's a simple yeah. thing. Whether they committed their crime 20 years ago or 25 years ago or five months ago or five yeah. minutes ago. That, that, so, you know, it's really important that people uh, remember that people who have watched the film know that there is a movement and it's not just about watching, it's yeah. about the activity afterwards. As you said, people have to do things. People have to do things and there has to be a movement for a prosecution. And yeah. in a way, the Hillsborough case proved that it can happen, yes. um, yeah. even though it happened a long time ago. It, it, uh, it was 30 years, 40 years, whatever it was, uh, it happened a long time ago, but it can happen if you can mobilize a kind of mass movement, if you can mobilize uh, opinion in, in sufficient numbers and with sufficient force. It can happen, but again, it's that question of, of traction, of, of whether or not it really makes a difference. You see, what we want is a prosecution I mean, what, what, what do we need to do? Do we need a, do we need a private prosecution of, of a chief constable? Do we need a private prosecution of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a high ranking police officer that we sort of hope that the Department of Public, Public Prosecutions will take over? Um, do we need a, an inquiry um, presided over by a top QC? All these things. Yeah. I personally think in the end, if, it, if it's gonna have a real impact, it's going to need something like this, hmm. but it's also going to need people to listen to what you're saying in the movie uh, and yeah. more, more people. And I think what the family is saying as well, and all, yeah. all those, what you've outlined is what the families have been talking about for a while. Uh, I don't think inquiries have worked. We've seen with no. McPherson and uh, Dave, yeah. uh, Anglish, they don't really work. But the only thing that's going to prevent officers killing is when they think there's a possibility they may go to jail. Mm -hmm. And until that starts to happen, uh, it's not just the one prosecution. And of course, the film is full of evidence. There is evidence and we have QCs who say that uh, Brian Douglas, the, uh, one of the main cases in the film, uh, one of the QCs said it's a clear case of murder. After the film was released, there was an inquiry by Lord Justice Butler uh, around the decision-making process of the CPS. And in that, in that report, Butler told the CPS, you must look at this case again. They looked at the case again and they simply said, we are not going to prosecute in this case. So, the, the, you know, the Crown Prosecution Service, who are responsible for uh, prosecuting the police are very very reluctant to do so and their excuse or their reasoning is always it's not in the public interest and what they mean by that is that it's in the public interest to protect the police at all costs and i think that's why we've seen an escalation in this country of deaths in custody and i just put this really at the foot of of the broadcasters of course but bfi and many organizations did release the film and take it around cinemas and it did really well, you know, internationally as well. Mm. Many countries bought the film and screened it. Uh, you know, it's been shown and broadcast all over the world, but not in the UK. I mean, we, you know, we talk about Channel 4 and of course Channel 4, but the BBC, we you know, we are, all of us, we are paying for the BBC, to be quite honest with you. I mean, that is something which is publicly funded and this is in the public interest. So, I mean, yeah. although of course, it's, there is an argument, of course, that Channel 4 should be doing it. In a way, there is an, an equal argument, perhaps a greater argument that the BBC should be, you know, putting aside two hours, you know, maybe knock off Mrs. Brown's boys for, for the evening and put on something important. 
I think Peter makes a great point. We're talking about 98 minutes of film in thousands and millions yeah. and millions of minutes over the far past. Of, you know, it's just, thousands. why can you yeah. not have this 98 minutes of the people's point of view, of the, the family's yeah. point of view? What is the danger of that? You can have every other minute to, you know, to keep the status quo and to yeah. have the point of view of the police, but what's wrong with giving 98 minutes? Uh, Ken, and I've got to ask this, you're a white filmmaker dealing with a subject that is right at the sharp edge of the black experience. Mm. Um, it's been suggested to me um, that maybe there should be more black filmmakers um, engaged in this space and making these type of films. Uh, and in fact, um, I'm not going to gloss over it. Um, we had uh, a bit of resistance ourselves in terms of just getting this screening uh, and this season um, uh, presented in the way it is. Um, identity politics drives a lot of the narrative around the racial discourse at the moment. Um, and I think that's a problematic, even in respect of Black Lives Matters. But do you think um, you've done justice to the subject in terms of you as a white filmmaker engaging with the brutality of, of, of you know, what is a, a, an experience which has been repeated over and over again, not just in the UK, but in Brazil, in Australia, um, et cetera. I'm a white filmmaker that's part of uh, a collective of people, migrant media, who are from migrant and black backgrounds. So my own experience as a, as a migrant kind of feeds into being able to have some knowledge of the black experience. I don't think uh, I can answer that question, but I would put it towards the families in the film because it was their choice to work with me, for example. And I don't think they see this as a film by a white filmmaker. They see this as a black film. And they see this as a black film because of the politics of the film. They see this as a black film because of the subject. And they see this as a black film because of Migrant Media, which is the organization that made it. So I think it's not really about me as an individual uh, driving this. Uh, I was part of a team of people. So uh, uh, the other thing I would say is obviously there are other black filmmakers that have dealt with the subject and, they, and they, could, they need to. I think we need a broad response to this issue. And if I was in a position of power, if I was in a position of uh, taking the only opportunity to make a film, then I would say, well, that's problematic, but it's a personal choice that we all made. And uh, Peter, just from your perspective, uh, the call for uh, a much blacker, if I can put it that way, Hollywood uh, and filmmaking industry, how do you see the future in terms of the impact of um, what's happening in, the, I suppose, the social space on the film industry in general? I, I, th I th absolutely endorse what Ken has said. I think it's very, very important. And I think we've got to look to the present and the future about bringing uh, people of colour into the filmmaking process and inside much, much more. If I can bring in a, a kind of subsidiary subject, I'm much less exercised on the question of do we drop Gone with the Wind from streaming services? And do we do that? I mean, I think, okay, you know, there's been a row about Gone with the Wind for, for, for decades. Uh, I personally don't think as, as, as important, the, all the energy you're using up shouting at each other about whether or not to ban Gone with the Wind, that energy would be better Agreed. expended on all those talented young filmmakers of colour who want to get their features made. That's what's, for me, much more important. Uh, and, I, you know, I am aware of my own status as a, a white man. I think you have to be very, very naive not to be aware of that. And I always am. Uh, and, I, and I hope that we at The Guardian are, always are. But I certainly want to endorse what Ken is saying, that, that firstly what he's saying is that as migrant media is a, as a collective approach to, to filmmaking, uh, again, which is what puts it outside the mainstream, incidentally, because mo most people aren't, they don't have that attitude. But I think, you know, it's about those old fashioned values. And I don't want to sound like an old fashioned liberal, but it's about solidarity and humanity. Um, and I think that's another, that's another, uh, that's another factor. Yeah, and I'd, I'd, I'd want to endorse that and uh, say that African Odyssey, we are very clear in our view that we do not believe that um, uh, only black people can make films about the black experience. And certainly uh, we don't believe that um, only white people can make films about the white working class or any class experience. So um, I think... Uh, uh, we understand the universality of many human experiences 
uh, and that's what we want to be able to plug into uh, uh, in a sense relay. Uh, and so with that, uh, gentlemen, I'm going to thank you for your time. And uh, I hope that uh, this will go out uh, and people will um, go away and, and see not only uh, Injustice, but many of the other films in the program um, that takes the title of Ken's film as its header. Um, and I hope that people would also um, think about the subject matter and go away and ask questions of both our uh, terrestrial uh, TV uh, stations as to why they're not actually engaging with this material. And Ken has mentioned not only his own um, migrant media setup, but uh, um, uh, Black Audio Collective and Shadow and others who've been uh, involved in this space. So again, thank you. And uh, uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.